<clears throat> yeah, so I'm uh, too, I don't completely understand this stuff, but I have a basic understanding. Um, so uh, inductive and co-inductive types are, says are two important forms of recursive type. Um, and most languages actually have both um, and they're not distinguished between, but some languages like Agda or interests have, they're actually, um, it's two separate types and they have two different ways of doing um, uh, pattern matching over them. Um, inductive types correspond to the least or initial solutions of certain type equations. Um, some people might understand what that actually means, but most people probably don't. And <laughs> co-inductive types correspond to their greatest or final solutions. Um, and I think this, these, these ideas come from uh, category theory. Um, oh, okay. Something about initial algebras and final algebras. Um, Which means I probably won't understand. Yeah. <laughs> uh, intuitively, the elements of an inductive type are those that are given by a finite composition of its introduction in forms. Um, something like NAT that we talked about before. Consequently, if we specify the behavior function on each of the introduction forms of an inductive type, then its behavior is defined for all values of the type. Um, usually we think of that as like fold. Um, uh, such a function is an iterator or a catamorphism. Um, and he doesn't talk about catamorphism anymore after this, but... Um, I can give an example later. Duly, the elements of a co-inductive types are those that behave properly in response to a finite co composition of its el elimination forms. Consequently, if we specify the behavior of an element on each elimination form, then we have fully specified the value of the type. Such an element is a generate generator or an anamorphism. Um, yeah, and natural numbers is the most important example, I guess. So what is this S here? I don't know what that is. S is just Over. successor. Oh, of right, successor, number. never mind, yeah. Yes. Yeah, and iter is basically fold, or you could think of it nat as natural induction in math. If you define something for zero and for n plus one, then you define it for all n. Yeah, so this is, uh, it's, it says, it's useful to combine zero and successor into a single induction form. So this is so that we can use those functors that we were just talking about, uh, the type schemes, I think people usually call them, but I guess he was calling them generic types. Um, right, so, right, and then so fold is actually going to be, it takes a sum of unit and that, which was Z and S, and then does pattern matching on it to figure out which case it wants to use, and then there's, there's the um, two cases. So what is going on here? Right, like these are the two uh, cases, one for Z and one for S. Yeah, and it's weird, it's odd that he calls, I don't really understand why, but I mean, he calls the construction function fold instead of the thing, instead of this rec, which we would like in most functional programming languages we would call rec fold. It, yeah, but uh, fold, fold is kind of, you, know, you give it a, you give it a like some type and then it returns you a natural number. So right. in that sense, it is a constructor function of natural number because it's introduced a natural number. But that's what this this rec nat thing is actually doing, right? This is the one that's taking a natural number 
and then turning it into. Yeah, it takes a natural number, so it's different. Fold, fold is like you give it a sum type, and it gives you back a natural number. And fold is the only way to introduce a natural number. Mm. Yeah, so like typically like fold, like for a list or something, you take a list and then you get back, um, you fold it down into a to some value, right? And that's the same yeah. thing here. Rec is taking a, this individual. Yeah, okay. just like uh, the name, the name is not a typical name, yeah. I guess, yeah. for fold. But I mean, I'm sure there's a reason that he's doing that. Um, uh, so I guess it's just the dynamics for fold. I, I think if you actually drew out the inputs because they're some types, they're like uh, recursive some types, it would actually look like a long list. Like the natural number sure. five mm -hmm. would be, you know, a, basically right. like a list of five things. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a, a, kind a, of this, why. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. Of course. Yeah. It's just a list with no values in it. Right. It just has a length, which is the, is the yeah. natural number. Yeah. So maybe that's why he chose fold, but I agree. It's kind of a weird name for this. Okay, so that's fine, right? Okay, so what does this thing say here? Oh, right, right, if we have a natural number, defined by fold, then we can take uh, a recursion over that and do pattern matching or whatever and get the result. Yeah, this is just an iterator. Yeah. Before. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and so the illustrated example of a co-inductive type is a stream, and a stream is just an infinite list of numbers. And I guess, yeah, the interesting thing is that you can, you can only look at an element if you've already looked at all the previous elements. Um, so, right, and so uh, this a stream is given by its behavior on the, under the eliminations forms for the stream type of head. Yeah, um, I'll talk about this differently later. The stream is introduced by a generator, a dual of an iterator that defines the head until the stream turns of the current state of the stream. Okay, so this is just the types. I don't know if there's anything interesting in there. Gen stream X is E in head goes to E1 X, E2 stream. I don't know what that means. Did he talk about gen stream already? No. No, it's, it's but it says it's uh, like, same as iterator and the, the dynamic of gen stream is below. Yeah. Currently it's just a type. All right. I don't know. I don't I don't know. Dynamics of streams. Okay, where's the interesting case here? So why is it going? I don't understand this syntax really. Oh, uh, substitution. Yeah, I understand that, but like why, what are these each rule mean here? I think yes, head is if it's head, then it's E1, else it's E2. That's the same as iterator. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and then since we want to extract the head, then we get even. So where does it talk about? Oh, sorry, I, I missed the front of the line here. That's my bad. Okay, yeah, if you take head, then it just does E1. If you take tail, then it does E2, right? But the important thing about E2 is it's actually generating a new stream, right? With a new E1 and a new E2. Yeah. And doing the same thing where we're combining the head and tail. So what's going on here? So, so E1, if you applied this function, you would get a new value and a new stream, right? Right, and E2 is the current stream. I, I st yeah, I still don't understand this x dot E uh, semicolon E, like E2 it's notation he uses all over the place. Yeah, I think it's just specific to gen stream, right? Has some specific meaning. Yeah, I agree. In that context, yeah, he uses it in other places as well, and I feel like there's some underlying reason for that, but I don't understand yeah. the underlying reason. Yeah, it doesn't. He doesn't use it above. So let's see. What is it? Where yeah, was it? It's yeah. how, how he's like abstract binding tree notation and. To be honest, it's confusing. I think I understand it, but I don't know how to explain it. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, it's like, fun. it's one of those things where you read it and you think you understand it, but then if you actually try to do something with it, then you figure out you don't understand it. Yeah. I think it's trying to suggest a meaning. Like he, he's, uh, Every all of these things just take arguments. They're all just lists of arguments. And when he has curly oh, break, I think I got it now. Actually, has... sorry. Go ahead. Finish. Sorry, your go sentence. ahead. No, no, it's, it's fine. <laughs> so this is actually two different pieces here. So this X only goes with the E one. Yeah, yeah. So this is like the current stream, and this is the thing that gets you the next stream. So it gets you the current head and the next stream. So this is like two parameters to this gen stream. Yeah. First, first parameter, second parameter. Does that make sense? So it's saying that uh, a stream has two components, right? One is the, the current, whatever. And then the thing that's going to generate you another stream. OK, yeah. So what's this? What I have, I don't know all my Greek letters. What's that called? Sigma. Sigma. Okay. Sigma. Yeah. So what is anyway? Oh, uh, okay. So I get it now. Yeah. So this is kind of the state of the stream. And the, 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 the NATs are the product or the what's being generated by the stream. So you can have some, some arbitrary state that's hidden that you're using to generate each natural number. So I don't know what a good example of that is, but I have code examples that make it more obvious. Okay. E2 for X. All right. Does anyone have trouble with this or? Uh, Right, so in order to get 
the next uh, entry in the stream, right? We're going to take the, the current state and plug it in over here which gets us of, of the current the value and the next stream, right? Uh, does that make sense? So it's just saying if we unfold a stream, then we take the current, uh, the current state, which is E2, plug it in this function X, to get the next stream and also get the, the value that we want out. Um, like, uh, this E1 has type nat cross uh, uh, sigma. Is that what you said? Sorry. Everyone is very silent. Yeah, I, it was a while ago that when I read this, but I, I don't, I, when I saw this, I couldn't see, I don't understand where map suddenly comes from. Uh, Why map. are you suddenly in generic? Um, I don't know, where does map come from? <laughs> uh, Yeah, <clears throat> like the in here is a specific case. It's not generic, but I. Yeah. So I, if I show you code, you'll understand. Just want to apologize for the people I offended, um, and the people that I made mad because I didn't have. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he was sorry too. Yeah. So, I think if uh. Let's see, can I share my other screen again? How much farther do we have to go? Lots, right? Um, yeah, so I think map, what is it doing? It's map from. Oh, so I guess, the thing is that, uh, like the, like this uh, state here, which is weird. It seems like a, like the, the type of the state could change with each iter iteration. So basically, every time you do unfold, you get another natural number and a new state, but the state could have a different type than what you had before. Um, I guess that makes sense why, or like why that possibility should be, should be possible. Yeah. But that seems like something that would be beyond what we're talking about now, but, um, but that's, that's what only explanation that I could come up off the top of my head for why this is like it is. So should we move on? No, no. Okay, so actually let's read the description, right? It uses a generic extension to generate a new stream whose state is the second second component. Expanding the generic generic extension will obtain, obtain the following reformulation of this rule. Right. Yeah. So get the get the left element as the value and get the new stream. Yeah, I guess this is actually more understandable. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, so he's making up a language that actually uses this stuff. Okay, so we're just adding these new inductive and co-inductive types. Um, yeah, and so this this is kind of like a, 
a fixed point operator for these uh, type uh, generic types. I'm going to call them type schemes because that's what people usually call them. But uh, yeah, these are like the fixed fixed point operators. Um, and one is the least fixed point and one is the greatest fixed point. Um, and then I guess this is pretty straightforward what, why they're, or how they're typed. Um, uh, so it's just defining a language that uses the things that we just talked about, which pretty much has exactly the same syntax as his formalization. With types, I don't know if you guys want to slow down and look at these, or, but they seem pretty straightforward. I think they're not like they're pretty standard things, aren't they? I remember coming across mu in um, Tony Hall's uh, communicating sequential processes without further explanation. Oh, uh, okay, yeah. Which is kind of weird, but you know, it suggests that you know, oh, everybody knows this stuff. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't. That's for sure. <laughs> so this just seems like a repeat of what we just talked about. I'm not sure why it's different. Just not with natural uh, numbers. Yeah, just like talking about it generically. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, so he's trying to say like a, is it like a con the connection between inductive and co-inductive types? So like if you produce an inductive value, you can use rec to take it apart, I guess. Or something yeah. like that, right? And then if you use now, where's the unfold? Oh, it's down here, right? Okay, right. And if you use unfold on a gen, you can actually you. This is the code that you run, which we talked about before. Yeah. Okay, and this is just a type preservation, I guess. Something like that, yeah. So you're either, when you reduce a expression, it's either a value or there's some, there's some reduction of it. And then there, all these programs are, terminating, so they're total. Right, so the star just means after many steps, you'll get to E prime. It may be, it may at first seem surprising that language with infinite data structures such as stream, streams can enjoy such a termination property, but bear in mind that infinite data structures such as streams are represented by a continuing state of creation and are not as a completed whole. It just means that we're value or we're calculating the elements one at a time. So we only ever, as long as we're only looking at a finite number of them, it'll end. Well, We'll only do a finite amount of evaluation. So this this uh, some mathematician person here should probably talk about this. Uh, the least solution of recursive function. This is the part that I don't really understand. I mean, I kind of understand it to use it, but I don't understand how it works really. It, it's fine. I guess we can skip that and maybe next time we can, if, if someone understand more, they can talk about that.
We can skip it for now. Okay. okay. So I'll give you code examples, which was that file that I was looking at before. <clears throat> Let's go back to the original. Sorry, let's actually run this inductive. Okay, so it type checks. Um, okay, so uh, so right, so let's go down here. This is this is uh, uh, nat f right. So like for the natural okay. numbers, we're trying to get. Uh, I guess. I'll just start here. I don't know. I didn't put this in here before. Like normally you would have like the type of natural numbers was uh, Z and S of nat, right? Um, and if you go through here everywhere, the type name appears, we're going to replace that with an A, right? So this is the sort of the functor for nat has a Z and a, an A, right? And uh, And then there's this... So basically, right, so we're going to have this equation that says the type natural numbers is this type nat f applied to the type nat, right? And um, it, we're trying to find the least fixed point of nat f. And the fixed point for people that don't know math means it, like uh, a point in the function where it returns the same thing that you put in, right? So this it, you put in nat, out comes nat. Um, and then there's, so there's this magic thing you can do uh, called fix that lets you actually find the least fixed point of a functor. Um, and uh, uh, so that's how we're getting inductive or, uh, yeah, right, an inductive type for the nat functor. Um, and then, uh, this is just defining a bunch of stuff so you can write formulas using it. Um, okay, so, oh God, this is like way too complicated. Um, uh, so I don't know what I was trying to do here, but this is the thing that he was talking about, the catamorphism, which is like uh, a generic map or generic fold over any functor. Uh, actually, so this this code isn't a good example. It's just like way too complicated. Um, Can you explain why the the nat f like nat is the fixed first fixed point? Um. Yeah. So I, if we uh, like expand this, um, like what is fix f? Uh, it's uh, T, so it's going to be, it's going to have a, a nat in there and then fix of whatever the T was, right? Um, maybe I'll call this F instead. It's not a type, it's a function of types. Um, uh, right, and so like every time we apply fix, it, we get another nat of fix F. Right. Um, uh, and we'll call this, uh, let's call this F instead so that you can tell the difference, right? So uh, this is F, this is F, right? So, so like every time we apply fix, we're getting back another list of, it's one longer, right? And this just goes on forever, right? So it's an infinite, uh, or <clears throat> actually, this this is actually making the um, this is actually making the co-inductive type. I, I got it wrong, um, but I mean, I guess you can interpret it either way as the inductive or the co-inductive type. Uh, but, uh, um, but anyway, it was kind of okay to just forget this whole thing that I talked about here and just know that well. I'm taking nat f, which was this little function here, which I, if I wrote it as a function instead, right? Like uh, ah, that, sorry, I'm not explaining stuff very well today. 
I should really look at this stuff. Uh, type goes to type. Um, right, so it's like a function that takes an A and produces this type. Um, so if we applied nat f to, to nat, we would get back uh, zf sf nat, something like that, right? Um, which is the, the thing that we're usually used to, right? This guy here. Um, but then the, the fix lets us say that, uh, I mean, when we defined it recursively, so we said nat equals nat f, so it equals this. So we can just say nat equals this, right? That's the thing that we're trying to get. So this is the thing that we talked about in chapter 14, right? The type scheme where some type goes to a type and he uses his T here instead um, and plus. Um, all right. Does that make any sense? I know I'm like being yeah, super yeah. confused. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I was just gonna say, yeah, the fix seems more like uh, a co-inductive type because you have, you really have like the head and the tail there. Right, let's see. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, so yeah, it's actually both, right? So like, uh, um, like when we like, so like, I mean, we're using this nat f to, to get this definition, right? And like, in Haskell or ML, this would this would be an inductive type, right? Where um, you know you can build elements of this guy by doing as many SFs of CFs as you want, right? Um, so that's this would be like all the in you know inductive values, right? Have that that kind of form, yeah. right? Yeah, I agree that that net is is. I would think that's an inductive type. Right, and then, but in Haskell, right, uh, since it's lazy, it's also a co-inductive type. Um, uh, but in other languages, like if I wanted it to do a co-inductive type, I would have to specifically say that this the second thing is lazy, right? That it's a thing that produces new streams. Um, which if you go by what he was doing in the book, would be something like uh, stream f of a nat comma stream f of a, or something like that, right? Um, uh, actually, I'm, I'm just making that more confusing. Um, yeah, so inductive types don't have these, these like lazy um, elements, but co-inductive types do have lazy elements that they that you don't get the value you don't get the value of the lazy element until you actually try to look at it. Whereas the inductive types, all of the values are stored in there on construction. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's where the. It, it gets kind of confusing because they both look exactly the same in programming languages or most programming languages. Um, uh, it, but um, it's kind of like uh, the way you use it. Like when I, if I do some function over uh, Nats, right? And foo of S, of whatever, and um, that goes to whatever. Um, so if it's inductive, I ha in order for this to be a total function, um, you have to make sure you're always doing something smaller on this side, right? Uh, whatever, return a character. Um, but if it's a co-inductive type, you don't, I don't know. What's the difference about co-inductive types? 
Sorry, I'm totally confusing because I don't understand this stuff well enough. Let's see, what did I do for co-inductive types? Oh, right, okay. So for this, for like, if you're using a stream uh, for to make this total, uh, you always have to construct an element on the other side, right? You always have to use the recursion as part of a uh, the constructor. Um, so that uh, like you're only, uh, I don't remember this. I was just reading about cock a couple of days ago. But uh, I mean, the, the, this thing over here has to be wrapped in some lazy uh, expression. I'm sorry, I'm just being completely confusing and not helping at all. I think it's helpful, but actually, yeah, I think what I said about fix probably isn't, isn't right. So I think I do yeah. think it's more inductive. So I agree with that. Yeah. But I mean, actually I'm creating a co-inductive type here too using fix, which is it's the same code. Um, Anyway, sorry. <laughs> it's all right. Yeah, I think uh, like uh, reading ahead, it's where it will be uh, much simpler once we get to going on system F and other yeah. practical type systems. I guess we can stop here. Yeah, so I guess one thing I wanna say is sort of like, yeah. uh, like, uh, Oh, actually, uh, never mind. It's too confusing. Okay. Yep. Okay. Sounds good. <laughs>